begin reading Genesis chapter number 21. Let's begin reading verse 12. We'll read all the way to verse number 20. The Bible says, And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, and because of thy bondwoman, and all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called, and also the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and took bread and a bottle of water, and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Verse 15, And the water was spent in the bottle. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs, and she went and set her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar, Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not. For God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thy hand. For I will make him a great nation. Amen. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we ask you in Jesus' name that you'll help this preacher tonight. I pray, Lord, you'll bless, Lord, my efforts, Lord, of studying and praying and, Lord, trying to be prepared, Lord. Lord, you know, I look at it as, as... I have the privilege of serving spiritual food. And Lord, it's, it's, it's part of my responsibility to make sure the food is right and ready. Make sure that it's good for the folks that they understand, that they can take and, and they can use it for their lives, Lord, each and every day. I pray that you'll speak through me. Give me clarity of thought, clarity of speech. Thank you for those that are here, the children, the teens, the adults. I pray you'll bless the ministries here of this church. And thank you, Lord, for those that support us, Lord, that we've never laid our eyes upon, Lord, never heard their voice. Lord, they listen, they support, uh, Lord, the sermon audio and video. We thank you for them. I pray you'll bless them. And, and Lord, those that are in our church and abroad, Lord, that are hurting in their heart, I pray you help them to look unto you because you're the author and the finisher of our faith. And it's better to trust in you than to put confidence in man. Help us now as we... Dive into this study in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. And amen. Yeah, amen. Thank you so much. Now, j- j- just quickly, I'll back up since it's been a couple of weeks since we looked uh, in the book of Genesis in our study. And so I just want to back up, just kind of breeze through here and get all the way to verse number 12 and, and share some of the new material that I have tonight. Uh, we saw in verses 1 and 2 that God is fulfilling the promise that he made to Abraham and Sarah uh, concerning of having a son. This son, of course, is Isaac. And we talked about with God, a promise spoken is always a promise kept. He is a faithful God. And we saw in verse 2 how that Isaac was born at a set time. We talked much about how that so often we pray with uh, this idea that that we're going to let God know that he has just so much time to answer or to show up and show out in our life and and yet God already has a set time for that answer for our prayer how we need to be patient how we need to wait upon the Lord and be of good courage wait I say on the Lord so the Bible says that Sarah conceived and of course that was not only shows us the the faithfulness of God's uh, fulfilling his promise but also shows the power of God she was an elder lady, a lady that, uh, according to the doctors of the day, would think that she wasn't able to uh, successfully uh, bear a child, but yet God gave her the power and God gave her the strength. And there's times in our lives that God may have something for us to do. And we need to understand that uh, it's not going to be done in our power, in our strength, that it has to be done in the Lord's strength, had to be done by the Lord's help. And that's what happened here with uh, Sarah giving birth to Isaac. Then we saw how that Isaac's name simply means laughter and how that Abraham uh, uh, 
few chapters ago, he had laughed because of joy, because of excitement that he was going to have a son. And then we saw that Sarah laughed, and she laughed because of disbelief. She laughed because uh, she didn't have the faith that Abraham had. And then we see again here that Sarah's laughing again. And of course, this is a different laugh in chapter 21. She's laughing with joy. She's laughing with excitement. And because of this laughing of praise, it's contagious. She said that, verse 6, she said that God hath made me to laugh so that all that hear will laugh with me. And we talked a little bit about how that uh, we influence each other. The Bible says iron sharpeneth iron. And how that we need to be careful. Now, I mentioned that if you want to be praising people, be people that wants to give their heart to the Lord and, and, and put their heart into whatever they do for the Lord, you hang out with those that want to do the same thing. You hang out with those that want to praise the Lord. Now, if you want to complain and be bitter and be negative, then find somebody that's like that. It won't be long. You'll probably be better at it than they are. And so we, sharp, we, we influence each other as iron sharpeneth iron. And so then we saw that Ishmael laughs. Now, Abraham laughs. Sarah laughs the first time. She laughs again. Then we see that a group of people laugh. The folks that knew Abraham and Sarah, they're laughing with praise. Abraham throws a feast, a feast of celebration. I mentioned this two Wednesday nights ago that I, I really believe that, yes, he's excited that he has a son. Who wouldn't be? He's excited about having his own boy now who's uh, through his wife Sarah's womb. and he's, he's, But I believe he's having a feast and a celebration because he's praising God who has been faithful to what he said he would do. And I'm glad we have a God that he's never failed me, he's never failed you, and he never, never will. I said two Wednesday nights ago, I said that uh, the promises that God makes, he's, he has fulfilled. And I was talking about uh, in reference to uh, here with Abraham, but I know there are some promises that lie up ahead that are not yet fulfilled, but they will be. They will be. I believe he's coming back just like he said. And uh, we used to sing that in the choir at Tabernacle. Uh, it says, I believe he's coming back just like he said. One day the trumpet's going to sound so loud it's going to wake the dead. And that right after my grandfather went to heaven, I would sing in the choir I would sing that part. One day the trumpet's going to sound so loud that it'll wake my granddad. And I would sing that because I believe that one day the trumpet will sound. And whether my old body has died, expired, if my time has come, if I'm, my shell's in a grave, or whether I'm here stomping around this earth, thank God, I believe he's coming again and I'm going where he is. Amen. Just like he promised. And so we talked about how Sarah experienced the miracle and how that from a dead womb came life. And what a beautiful picture. What a beautiful picture it is, Isaac, as a picture of Jesus Christ. Abraham, a picture of God. In the next chapter or two, we'll see what a beautiful picture it is, how Abraham is willing to give his son as a sacrifice and how that Isaac being a picture at times of Jesus Christ. If Isaac... Came, his life came from a dead womb. So did eternal life come from a dead tomb. Amen. Nothing should have came from that tomb but death. But Jesus changed things up. Amen. And we were dead people walking. Do you believe that? We were dead men walking. and uh, But yet through the grace of God, we've been made alive. We've been quickened. We've been made alive through Jesus Christ. Now, as we get to verse... Number 12, I want you to notice with me, the Bible says, And God said unto Abraham, Let not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad. Now, <clears throat> what has happened to refresh your memory is that Ishmael has laughed. He is mocking <clears throat> Sarah and Isaac. And Sarah is upset. And Sarah says, I want, you to, uh, I want you to cast this bondwoman out, this old slave woman, Hagar, and let her son Ishmael go with them. Well, I'm totally out of my sight. I don't have nothing to do. I don't want to be an heir uh, uh, of, our, of our treasures, of our property. I just want to be Isaac. Get rid of them. Really? And so, of course, verse 11 says it was, this thing was very grievous to Abraham's heart. You know that Abraham at one time, uh, he begged God. He said, what about Ishmael? God said, I'm going to bless Isaac. And he's going to be a great nation and so forth. And then... Abraham, because of his love for Ishmael, Ishmael was his son too. 
Abraham begged God, said, what about Ishmael? And God said, I've heard you about Ishmael, and I've got, uh, I'll take care of him too, but he's not Isaac. And we're going to deal a little bit with that tonight, uh, the difference here uh, in Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael is not going to be the seed in which God has is, is promised Abraham. Isaac will be the seed that will be blessed, not Ishmael. Ishmael will enjoy some blessings, but in, in this, this covenant, this promise that God has with Abraham, it's not going to continue through Ishmael, but through Isaac. So notice verse 12, God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of the bondwoman, and all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her ver- voice. Watch this. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. It's very, a very obvious statement here that God wanted to inform Abraham. He wanted to inform Sarah. He wanted to inform Isaac. He wanted to inform Ishmael and Hagar and all their descendants and you and I today and those that will come after us before the rapture of the church that it is Isaac, it is Isaac that the seed will be called. It's not Ishmael. Not Ishmael. Now, we do have, as I said last week, we do have a religious group that is, uh, that is rapidly multiplying in our world today. And they are those that are the Muslims. They are those of the Islamic faith. And their forefather, of course, is Ishmael. And they claim that Ishmael is the promised seed, that it's through Ishmael that God's blessed. But God has made it very clear that it's not Ishmael, it is Isaac. Isaac is the one. And of course we know after Isaac uh, came Jacob. Then after Jacob came the twelve sons of Jacob. And of course from the twelve sons of Jacob came the twelve tribes of Jacob, or the twelve tribes of Israel. And it was Jacob whose name was changed to Israel. Israel. And so... He is making it very plain here, but yet they still, the Muslim, the Islamic crowd, still proclaims that they are the promised seed, and that's why their descendants today, the Muslims or the the Arabics, are fighting with the Jews. The Jews are the descendants of Isaac, and they're at war one with another. Even today, you don't have to you don't have to watch the world news long to find that out, right? You know what's going on in the Middle East. You're not, you're, you, you don't need to be educated on that. There's a war going on there. They're warring over the birthright. They're warring over the promised seed, but God's already settled it. It is Isaac, and it is his descendants who are the Jews. It is not uh, the people, uh, the Arabic people. Now, notice verse 13. The Bible says, and, and also the son of bondwoman will I make a nation. Because he is thy seed. Ishmael is the son of Abraham, but he's, he's not the son of Sarah. Right. And the seed was promised not only to Abraham, but to Sarah. Very, the Lord's being very distinctive there. It's through Abraham and Sarah, not just Abraham. Right. You remember how Ishmael was born, don't you? You remember that? It was because they had an idea. Right. They got ahead of God. And Sarah said, won't you just marry my Egyptian bondwoman, and after marriage, see if she'll give you a son. Well, they, it worked. She was fertile, and she had a son by the name of Ishmael. And so Ishmael is in the New Testament. We'll, hopefully we'll get there in another week or two. Ishmael represents the flesh. Isaac represents the man of faith, the man of faith and the man of flesh. Isaac was a son because of faith. Abraham and Sarah believed God. But yet, Ishmael was a son because of the flesh. Sarah did not believe God, so her flesh said, let's make another way. You marry Hagar. And so Ishmael in the New Testament is called the man of flesh, while Isaac is called the man of faith. And we'll look more into that uh, maybe in the next uh, Wednesday nights. It's very interesting how the New Testament deals with Isaac and Ishmael. Now, we know that... These descendants of Ishmael are the Muslims, and and we know that uh, there's a lot going on in our world today about Muslims and the Islamic faith, and so I just want to deal with some things about that. In the next probably the next uh, two or three weeks, we're going to deal with the Islamic faith. We're going to deal with the Muslim Muhammad and Allah, 
And so you have a better understanding. Uh, most of you in here would quickly say, we know that it's a, a cult. We know that it doesn't line up with God's Word. We know that Allah is not God, but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God, and besides Him, there is no other. But we need to go a little deeper, So as, as and I'm, I'm telling you, and I'll give you some statistics, uh, probably not tonight, but I'll be sharing some statistics of how uh, the Muslims are increasing uh, uh, every single day. They're taking over countries today. And so we, we need to understand the Muslims and we need to understand the Islamic faith. Now, of course, we know that they have been wrongfully deceived or wrongfully instructed uh, by the teachings of Muhammad. Now, Muhammad believed that the Old Testament and, of course, the New Testament were not true, that he did not believe that the Bible was God's Word. He believed that what he had received from the angel Gabriel was, was the truth and the only truth. Actually, you read the Koran, or somebody could take, share with you the Koran. The Koran says that those that believe in Allah and Muhammad and the teachings of Muhammad will spend eternity in heaven. That's what they teach. You must believe in Allah. You must believe in Muhammad and the teachings of Muhammad. Muhammad believes that he was the last true prophet to ever be on this earth. He believes that he received revelations from the angel Gabriel. He at first thought that he was demon-possessed. He first thought that there was something wrong, but he later said when he was 40, around 40 years old that he realized that Allah had something very special for him, a mission, and he was to be the last great prophet. He does believe that that Adam and Abraham and, and Jonah were, were prophets of God, but he says that they didn't give the, the whole truth, they didn't disclose the truth, and it's been, uh, it's been somewhat uh, 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 messed with in a way that it's corrupt now. And so God, or Allah, which, uh, uh, which by the way, the Muslims believe that Allah is the same God that you worship. They believe there's only one God, His name is Allah. God in Arabic is Allah. That's where the name comes from. And they believe that the God of the Muslims is the same God of the Christian and He is the same God of the Jews. But the Jews and the Christians hadn't got it figured out. They've been given bad information. But the Muslims, they know what's right and wrong. And the, word, and the reason that they, the Jews and the Christian. Uh, have got it all wrong is because they've been misled misled by the Bible. And so we're going to deal a little bit about Muhammad and Allah. And so uh, Muhammad claimed to, uh, of course, be the last true prophet and that Allah wants all people to be Muslim. Or, this is important because we're heading this way, the Koran teaches that Allah wants everybody to be Muslim in the Islamic faith, or that they are ruled by Muslims. That they are ruled by Muslims. And you don't have to get on the Internet much and find, see those things happening today. So it's almost like, you know, if you're not going to become a Muslim, as long as we rule over you. Well, we'll deal with some of their teachings and, and some of the things that we need to be alarmed about as we go through this. Now, Muhammad did not believe that, uh, that Jesus was the Son of God. Most of these cults today, they do not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. The Mormons believe that Jesus and Lucifer are brothers and that, that Jesus worked his way to become a God and that as a, as a Mormon, you can work your way into becoming a God. They believe that. They believe in three heavens and I don't want to deal with Mormons and Muslims, but there's just a lot of, a lot of deceitful, wicked uh, 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 information going from these false cults today. Now, I said earlier that Muhammad believed that the angel Gabriel, or he said the angel Gabriel gave him uh, uh, the, the, the doctrines or the foundation of the Islamic faith. Uh, it was after his death that 
folks that were in his court, and we'll talk about his power here in a little bit, uh, that knew him personally, remembered some of the things he would recite, the things he would say, and they wrote it all in a book, and it became known as the Koran. The Koran. Now, no one ever saw one of the many encounters that Muhammad claimed to have with the angel Gabriel. Not one person has ever came forth and said, I was there, I seen it. But it's interesting to me that over 500 people saw our resurrected Lord. Amen. Over 500 people saw our resurrected Lord before He ascended into heaven. Now, let me share some things, and I, I can tell you're very interested, and I appreciate that. Muhammad was born in the city of Mecca, M-E-C-C-A, it's in Saudi Arabia. He was born around 570 A.D. A.D. is, of course, after, uh, after uh, Jesus Christ, after the birth and life of Jesus Christ. Now, Mecca was also a, the home of the religious uh, building that they named Kaaba. Kaaba. And inside the Kaaba, which is a cube-shaped building, which they, they say Mecca, of course, Saudi Arabia, in Mecca, here's this cube-shaped building, it is called the Kaaba, and, Kaaba, and in the Kaaba is a meteorite. And the meteorite is named the Black Stone. And the Black Stone is believed by the uh, Arabic nation and by the Muslim to be a sacred stone from heaven. And so this Black Stone is in, in, there in the city of Mecca, in that uh, religious building, sacred building of the uh, Kaaba. Now, after Muhammad was 40 years old, he began to preach these doctrines about one God, Allah, and his name was Allah, and that he was having these revelations, and he was the last true prophet. Well, of course, there was folks that, that didn't believe him. and I mean, just here he is, come out of nowhere, and begin to say, I'm receiving revelations from the angel Gabriel. And, and there's only one God, his name is Allah. And because of this, uh, many believe, but there were some that would not believe uh, in the city of Mecca. And it is reported that through hi in history that the ones that mainly were against, uh, in Mecca were against uh, Muhammad's teaching was the business people of Mecca because they were making profit off the many gods or the many religions of Saudi Arabia and him coming in saying there's only one God would hurt their business. So they didn't really want to follow after somebody like that. And he taught that if you believed his teachings and if you believed in Allah, that he was the God and that Muhammad is his prophet, then you could live in heaven for all eternity. Now, because of his controversial teaching and because of the doctrines that he was giving, uh, he felt that it was best for him and his followers to leave Mecca. And they left Mecca around 622, I wrote this down, make sure I'm right, about 622 A.D. And they went a several hundred miles, and I want to make sure I get this town right, uh, north of Mecca in the town of Yathrib, 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 which soon became known as the city of the prophet. Now, in that city of Yathrib, the city of the prophet, uh, Muhammad came to power, in religious matters and in government matters. He became the leader in religion and he became the head of government in Yathrib or the city of the prophet. And those, as he went to power, those many folks because of terror and because of, uh, uh, because of his power, they began to, begin to believe or say they believe what he taught was true. And Muhammad proclaimed that uh, if... If you're not a Muslim, then you're supposed to be ruled by the Muslims. And so, after he got a following up together, I think the number was around 10,000 in Yathrib, uh, he decided that he wanted to go back to the city he was born in. He decided he wanted to go back to the city that, that had the religious cubed uh, building of the Kaaba and of the black stone, the sacred meteorite. He wanted that land, and so him and 10,000 of his followers declared holy war on Mecca, Saudi Arabia. And, of course, they went, and, of course, they conquered Mecca, Saudi Arabia, and they made, Me they made Mecca the capital of the Islamic faith. The word Islam and is the Arabic word for surrender, for surrender. And so 
the city surrendered under uh, to Muhammad, and Mecca became the the capital city of this new, or they thought was new, but it kind of traces back, and I, I we'll talk about that later. But of this new religion of Islam, and of course the followers would be called Muslims. Now, first thing that he declared was that, of course, that Allah is the only God. He also declared that he was the only true prophet. And then he declared that the Old Testament uh, was not true. The Old Testament was not true. And many people began to follow Muhammad, but there was one group of people that took a stand uh, that would not follow Muhammad, and that was, of course, the descendants of Isaac, the Jews. Uh, because when you discredit the Old Testament, uh, the reason he was doing that is because his people were the descendants of Ishmael, and he was declaring that they were the promised seed. They were the seed that, of Abraham. And the Jews said, no, we've got the Old Testament. The Old Testament teaches us that Isaac, our forefather, was the promised seed. And so he says, well, guess what? The Old Testament's a lie. I'm sure you've got your Bibles open to Genesis 21. I'd like to share three verses that I, I bet you that Muhammad probably didn't really like. Him being a descendant of Ishmael. Watch this, verse number 2. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him whom Sarah bare to him Isaac. I guarantee you Muhammad didn't rejoice over those two verses. He wasn't happy that Isaac was born. Even today, even today, the descendants of Ishmael are warring against the descendant of Isaac. Verse number 8. I'm sure he didn't like this verse in Genesis 21. And the child grew. This is talking about Isaac. And was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. I'm sure he didn't like that. I'm sure he didn't like the idea that his father celebrated I don't remember that being said of Ishmael, do you? Because Abraham knew it wasn't a promise seed. Abraham knew in his heart that him and Sarah had sinned against God. They had disobeyed God. They had tried to get ahead of God. I was telling somebody the other day about the will of God, and they said, well, I don't, we, we just don't know if you're excited for us. I said, I care nothing about this in your life. All I care about is you do the will of God. I said, I don't know what the will of God is. You still don't know. But all I care about is you do the will of God. That's what I get excited about, that you are in the will of God. Amen? And he got excited that God's promise had been fulfilled. Whatever it may be, whatever it, God wants you to do, that's what excites me when you do that. Amen? Not your will, not what you want. It'll fail every time. It's, you'll be miserable outside the will of God. You need to stay in His will. And when you're there and you have the peace that passes all understanding, this pastor will be one of the first ones to take the pom-poms and say, Go, go, go. Amen? That's the way I feel. Worse to put, put too much time in preaching. For, and, and I'm just going to be honest with you. I want you to be in the will of God. Amen. Abraham Lincoln said it well. He said it. He said, inside the will of God, there's no failures. Outside the will of God, there'll be no success. Well, how true that is. I'm talking about success according to God. You know, the world may say, well, they're successful. What does God say? What does God's Word say? There's no success outside God's will. Stay in His will. And I believe the last verse Muhammad did not like would be verse 12. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman and all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Well, I bet he'd like to take the pen knife and cut that out. Boy, don't you know he'd love to put Ishmael there inside, inside, and said, instead of Isaac? That's very plain. I'm sure those are four verses there that... that that helped him come to this, this, um, um, this fictional thought that the Old Testament is not true. Because if the Old Testament is true, then Ishmael, their descendant, is not the promised seed, and they're not the promised children of Abraham. Now, let me uh, 
share some more things with you about uh, the Islamic faith, and this is probably going to take uh, several studies, but I just want to help you with some things. He went back to Mecca, as I said, and they declared holy war. Of course, you and I know that it was unholy war. was nothing holy about it. And, but he declared holy war on the city of Mecca. Mecca had turned their back on him. The businessmen had stood up against him and pretty well ran him off. And so he's coming back. And he conquered. And he destroyed and Mecca became the capital city of the Islamic faith. Now, uh, I said earlier that the words that, that uh, Muhammad said he received from the angel Gabriel, who of course received them from Allah, were wrote down in the Quran. Now, in the Quran, I will deal more about this uh, uh, when the time comes, but basically in the Quran, it teaches there's only one God, and His name is Allah. It teaches that this God, Allah, is also the God of the Jews and the God of Christians, and that the Jews and the Christians misunderstood God and His teachings. The Quran rejects the Bible. It says that the Bible is not God's Word. And it says that Allah has revealed His will through one prophet and one prophet alone, and that is Muhammad. And so you must believe in the teachings of Muhammad in order to, as they say, spend eternity in heaven. Now, I know many of you have heard about, when you talk about the Islamic faith, you've heard of the five pillars of Islam, the five pillars of Islam. We're going to look at one of those pillars tonight, uh, right here in our scriptures, and it is the fifth pillar, the fifth pillar of Islam. Now let's look at verse 14 through 20, and l listen as you read this in your heart as I read it aloud to you tonight. Just get this story in your mind. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and he took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, which is Ishmael, and sent her away, and she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle, and he drank all the water up. She cast the child under one of the shrubs, and she went and set her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of he out of heaven, and said unto her, What aideth thee, Hagar? Feel not. For God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thy hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and notice this, she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water, and gave the lad drink. Now, I want to deal with the fifth pillar of Islam, and and that is the Hajj, the Hajj. And that is, of course, the annual pilgrimage that the Muslims take to the city of Mecca. Uh, you may have seen it on TV. Every time they have this, it's usually on the 12th month of the Islamic calendar. It's usually between the 8th and 12th day of the Islamic calendar, on the last month of that calendar. And TV uh, uh, news will report uh, the Hajj, H A. JJ, the Hajj, and they'll report it, and they'll show you pictures of people making this pilgrimage to the capital city of Is Islam. Uh, all these Muslims will march to, uh, 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 to Mecca. Now, the, the inerrant Word of God says that what happened in this chapter was that Hagar and Ishmael were sent out by Abraham. God said, do exactly what Sarah suggested. It's the will of God. I, I need that. You don't understand now, Abraham, but I'm making Isaac a great nation. And down the road, the descendants of Ishmael is going to war against the descendants of Isaac. So you, you send them down the road. So he goes, and of course he, bring, he has uh, water there and, and bread, and, and they go out into the desert and the wilderness. And while they're there, of course, the water is spent, the Bible says. They drank all the water. And... Hagar gets concerned about Ishmael and thinks that Ishmael's going to die. And she's so concerned about Ishmael that uh, she begins to uh, weep and she decides that the best thing for her to do is to uh, take Ishmael and hide him where she can't see him die. 
And so she goes over to the side, and she sits over there on the side. Now, the Bible says that while she is worrying and weeping about Ishmael, that God's voice uh, uh, through the angel of God, of course, it, the angel of God only speaks what God tells them to say, so through the angel of God, God speaks to Hagar and says, Hagar, what aileth thee? What's, what's wrong? And says, well, we're here to die. My son Ishmael is going to die. And he says, no, he's not going to die. And, and God miraculously uh, allowed a, a well to spring up. Water began to spring up from the ground. And so from that, they were refreshed, revived, and they were able to. And you'll see in verse 21, he goes on to uh, get married. And we'll see some more about Ishmael down the road, but he gets married, so they survive because of God's grace and mercy. Now, when we talk about the Hajj, or the fifth pillar of the Islamic faith, uh, which is, when I say Hajj, H-A-J-J, that is the annual pilgrimage of Muslims to the city of Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Now, this whole idea of the Hajj or the whole idea of the fifth pillar uh, all started, many people believe, they they trace it back to Genesis 21. They trace it back to here. And I'm going to share some of the rituals that go on in the Hajj, in this annual pilgrimage, and you'll see some similarities here. And you'll understand why they claim that this fifth pillar goes all the way back to Abraham and how just another a way to support their doctrine that they are the promised seed of, of God through Abraham. Now, the Muslims will tell you, when you talk about the Hajj, uh, this pilgrimage to Mecca, they'll tell you that ha- this how it went. Abraham was ordered uh, by Allah to leave Hagar and Ishmael in a desert in the wilderness. Now, after Abraham left, some time later, uh, they got thirsty, and Ishmael got thirsty and was at the uh, brink of death. And they say, the Muslims say, that uh, Hagar actually ran back and forth seven times, back and forth searching for water. And she did this seven times, and Ishmael cries. And when he cries, he hits the ground with his foot. And when he hits the ground with his foot, up springs up a well of water. Some versions, some Muslims teach that what actually happened, what they believe happened, is that when Hagar is running to and fro seven times looking for water, that, that an angel came to Ishmael, and with the tip of his wing, he scraped the ground, and by scraping the ground, water sprung up as a well, as a well. And so the, this source of water today is called the well of Zamzam. I, I, I hope I'm pronouncing right. Some, there's so many different dialects and so forth, but Z-A-M, Z-A-M. It's actually called the well of Zamzam, Zamzam today. Now, years and centuries later, Muhammad comes on the scene. And in 631 A.D., uh, when he made that trip back to Mecca to conquer it, you remember that story? He was, he was pushed out. He comes to power. He becomes the leader in religion and in government matters and, 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 and the city of the prophet. He brings 10,000 followers with him. They conquer Mecca. Now, they consider that, that journey several hundred miles from Mecca to Mecca as the very first uh, very first Hajj that uh, uh, that the Muslims ever made. Very first, and so and it's and and it's and it's it's been proven that it is the only Hajj that Muhammad ever made, and so it became because of Muhammad's journey back to Mecca with ten thousand of his followers to conquer the city of Mecca. Uh, and by the way, when he got there, he destroyed the idol gods and all that they they worship many gods. He said he purified the the building, the the Kaaba, the building, and and he purified everything there, and it became uh, back a pure city uh, for the Muslims and the Islamic faith. 
Now, we know that in the Scripture here that that's not, that's not what happened, is it? There's no angel scraping his wing on the ground, are they? Are they? There's none of that. I don't see Ishmael stomping his feet on the ground and up springs water. What I do see is that there's a God in heaven that has the power to do what He will and that God has grace and mercy to Hagar and to Ishmael and He gives them water. Because, yes, God has a plan and purpose for Isaac and his descendants, but God also has a plan and purpose for Ishmael and his descendants. And today what you see in the Middle East is exactly what God said would be. It's exactly what God preordained. There are war between the descendants of Ishmael, the Muslims or the Arabic people, against the descendants of Isaac, the Jews. And so uh, this became the fifth pillar of Islam is this journey, this pilgrimage. And every year, every year, uh, they have this pilgrimage where thousands upon thousands upon thousands will journey the twelfth month of the Islamic calendar in between the eighth and twelfth day of that month. They will journey uh, to the city of Mecca. They actually have in Saudi Arabia and around, they actually have rates for airfare during that time, special rates, uh, because it's become such a huge, huge uh, event. Many, many Muslims. Now, the Quran teaches that one of the pillars is this journey, and you have to do it. Every, every able-bodied Muslim must take this journey one time in their life. They must take this journey at least once in their lifetime if they're, if they're able. Uh, and so, the Muslims believe that when they perform this Hajj or this pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, for the Islamic faith, they believe that they're, uh, they're showing their unity. They're showing their unity. I'm amazed of how that one thing that, and I don't want to be at all, give any credit to false cults or give any a positive remark at all, but I will say that these false cults, one thing about them, they do have unity. And it's the Christians that always seem to be the ones not getting along. That's sad. Sad. It, you know, I also say it's also they're the ones that's also working the hardest. And JWs, they work hard. The Mormons work hard. And uh, so, uh, and I, I'm not at all speaking well of them. I'm just trying to say that for you and I as God's people, the redeemed, the ones that have the truth tonight. Amen. We got the truth. And we, you know, we've got the truth and we're, we're, we're going to have to give an account. If these people act this way and are so lively and so real and so uh, uh, zealous of this false cult, well, what can be said about God's people who have truly been redeemed, who truly know the, the one God, God Jehovah, and how lazy sometimes we are? They believe that it is an act of unity. And so thousands upon thousands every year will take this journey or this hajj to fulfill the fifth pillar of the Islamic faith. Now I'll say this in closing. Uh, it also symbolizes their, their showing their submission to Allah. They're showing their submission to Allah. Now, the hajj has several series of rituals and, and I'll say this in closing. I've got about seven minutes, but several rituals that they do. Uh, once they reach the city of Mecca and they reach the cubed building, the religious building that they call Kaaba, they counterclockwise march around seven times. Exactly what they said. Hagar ran back and forth seven times. And originally what they were to do was to kiss the black stone, the meteorite that they said was sacred. And after they did that, they were to run back and forth to, uh, they had, uh, I don't know exactly the, the name of the places, but they were to run back and forth, and they were to drink water from the well of Zanzim, the very well that they said Ishmael drank from, and Hagar. They were to do that. Then they do the stoning of the devil. 
They will cast rocks against a wall and they are stoning the devil. And several things they do. They do animal sacrifices during this time. And, uh, well, now that Islam is, has grown, rapidly has grown, uh, you don't have to because of uh, uh, health concerns. You don't have to kiss this black stone. You all you have to do is go by and point at the black stone on, on every counterclockwise. Every time you pass, you point at the black stone. You don't have to kiss it. Uh, also, people can perform. You can have somebody perform your animal sacrifice. You don't have to do that. And then also they changed it where there were so many people getting hurt by the rocks being thrown against a stone wall at bouncing back and hitting people that now they have it fixed where there's actually a a net that catches the stones when you throw it so nobody gets hurt. The the Saudi Arabia has a website concerning uh, the Hajj, and and I, I, I can't tell you exactly what it says. I was hoping I brought it with me, and I don't see it got it in my Bible. But in the website, because uh, hundreds are trampled on every year, they're trampled on every year, uh, I wish I'd brought that picture uh, to show you. I've got a picture of folks actually walking around the black stone, the meteorite, the sacred meteorite they call, and people are trampled on every year. There are bridges that collapse because of the weight of too many people, and hundreds of people die every year because of this. And so they've had to put in some, some rules and regulations, and on the website, of the Saudi Arabia website concerning the, the Hajj pilgrimage, uh, it says to, basically it says to, to be nice, be polite, and don't trample people. That's what it says. Be nice, be polite, and do not trample anybody. And, I mean, it's sad. It is sad. The, the men wear a, a, a two-piece garment that is, is white, and they wear that, and while they wear that outfit, the ladies have to wear a modest dress. They don't have to cover their hands or face. It has to be the modest dress that they're accustomed to. But the men uh, wear, it's called arham, arham, and they wear that as two pieces. And when they wear it, they're not, they're not to shave, they're not to have any sexual intercourse, and they're not to swear. Hallelujah. What a blessing. So they just got, these are things they're not, they're supposed to do. And, I was reading today, and I'd like to close with this because there'll be more said about the Islamic uh, cult. But I'll say two things about it. I want you to know, number one, and, and I'm not being rude at all. And I'm, I'm just telling you straight, and you need to know this. Uh, anyone believes anything contrary to God's Word, they are not, they are not our brothers in Christ. They are not our brothers in Christ. Number two, uh, especially with the mosque, they want on 9-11 site, they're declaring that, yes, there's the extremist Islamic folks, the extreme Muslims. Hence, we have 9-11 and all across the country. But the religion, Islam, is a religion of peace. It's a religion of peace. I will tell you this, that God's Word says there's no peace to the wicked, saith the Lord. And what they teach and what they practice does not line up with God's infallible and errant Word. Don't be deceived by someone who says, I believe in the same God you do. Okay? Don't. Don't be deceived by that. Because the Muslims believe that their God is your God. You just don't understand them like we do. Muhammad is his prophet. And we have his writings, the Koran. And the Bible is false. I'm glad that when it comes to Christianity, I'm, not, I'm talking about Christianity. I'm talking about Christianity. Washed by the blood of Jesus Christ for salvation, by faith through grace, because of the sacrificial death of Jesus on Golgotha's cross, 
And three days later, He resurrected. Because of that, we're redeemed. We're saved. We're saved. And Islam sadly has five pillars that they stand upon as the foundation of their faith, of their beliefs. But the Word of God says that no other foundation can be laid that is already laid, Jesus Christ. My foundation in my faith is not a Hodge, it's not a Koran, it's not anything like that, it's Jesus Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. You ought to rejoice tonight that you stand on Jesus. When you got Him, you don't need another pillar. You don't need two, three, four more. You don't need anything. You just need Him. Amen. Aren't you glad you got Him tonight? I'm glad I got Him tonight. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to the sermon today. We hope and pray that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible says in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says in John, chapter number 14, that Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Our prayer here at Open Door Baptist Church is that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, Jesus Christ loves you. He died for you, and He's more than capable and more than willing to cleanse you from unrighteousness and from your sins and make you a child of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The Bible says if you repent, turn from your sin and turn to Jesus Christ and by faith believe in His death, His burial, and His resurrection for your salvation, you too can be saved. Our prayer is that you think upon this and that very soon you'll make an eternal decision to receive Jesus as your personal Savior. Thank you so much.